the new year is often a time of reflection. A chance to look back on the past 365 days and remember. Sometimes the memories bring a smile, and other times they break our hearts. Chances are you've experienced a bit of both this past year. The new year is also a time to look ahead, to imagine what could be, to scan the horizon with expectation and seek God's guiding hand. It's a time to strive for better, to live louder, love stronger, and be more of who God has created us to be. It's an opportunity for new beginnings, a chance to start fresh, to pursue God with a renewed passion, and to press on with all our hearts. The truth is, God has been faithful this past year, and that faithfulness promises to carry us through the next. As the new year begins, may we remember this one simple truth. In Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. Come on, everybody. That's the truth, everybody. This is the truth. Therefore, therefore, if anyone, look at your neighbor, say you're an anyone. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. You know what new creation means? New formation. Whatever you've been through, if anyone is in Christ, they become a new creation, the scripture says. Old things have passed away. How many of you have some old things you like to pass away? Yeah? Behold, all things have become new. God is a God of new beginnings. And as we look at 2023, I have good news for you. God is a God of new beginnings. And you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so if you're going to try to do it without Christ Jesus, it's not going to work. But if you do it through and in Christ Jesus, you can be a new creation. All things have passed away. And behold, all things are new in 2023. Wouldn't that be great, everybody? Come on, can we thank God for that truth? Come on. All right. Well, my name is Eric Bucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. If this is your first time being here at Cornerstone, I personally want to welcome you. Thank you for coming. just want to let you know how much God loves you and how we're glad that you're here. And uh, God knows everything about you. He knows your DNA. He knows everything about you, and he loves you, and he's calling you to a higher place, not because he wants the worst for you. He wants the best for you, and that's just what it's all about. I've had the privilege uh, of being away a few days to, to fast and pray. And I'm not saying that to, uh, for self, trying to be braggadocious. I'm just saying it because I need God. I need God, and I think we all need God. And uh, as I've been uh, doing that, I, I believe God has good things for us in this new year. And I know God wants you to flourish in 2023. And I understand you're like, oh, no, not again. All these promises in 23 by Valentine's Day. 80% of people that make resolutions don't follow them anymore. I understand that. So if you, can't, if you can't get on the treadmill, wait till after Valentine's Day, and you'll be plenty of space on the treadmill. But can you guys do me a big favor? Can you welcome everyone that's watching in line, everyone that's here for the first time, nice and loud? Come on, the best is yet to come. All right. Well, I was away uh, praying and, and going away and just asking God, planning the year and asking the Lord to, to give me more revelation and and it's just a wonderful time to get away. Uh, I, I got kind of something funny in the shower. God often speaks to me in the shower. I don't know why. Uh, it makes the bills more expensive. Uh, but uh, the kind of the theme I think God has for us this year, I know it sounds a little like a, like, a, like a cliche, but it's not. And here it is. You ready? A new me in 23. <laughs> oh, come on, Pastor. What is that? That's so stupid. I know it is, and that's why I like it. A new me in 23. Here it is, all right? Here's the statement. And it's not grammatically correct. That's why it's so great, okay? A new godly me in 23, through the spirit, with the body, you'll see. It's Dr. Seuss. I understand that. But it's going to stick on you, okay? A new me in 23. A new godly me in 23, through the spirit, with the body, you'll see. Listen, everybody. There's no reason why we can't have a new person in Christ. If you and I, we can go new in Christ. It could be a godly new me in 23 with a, how do we do that? We do it through the Spirit of God. Through the Spirit of God, all right? 
through the body, which is the body of Christ, which is each other, God has not called us to walk alone, you'll see. And I'm telling you right now, if you and I will commit to be filled with the Holy Spirit, commit to be a part of a body, not just to come here on Sunday and fill a chair, but actually to get to know some people, gather in smaller groups where you have someone that can watch over you and help you because we are an army, everybody. We get here on Sunday, we talk to each other, we encourage each other, then we go out on the field. And I was just watching a, a war movie the other day. I'm not going to try to uh, pronounce it, Dirk, Dirk Kirk, or whatever it was called. I can't say it, even though I would, but whatever it's called. And, uh, and my son and I were watching it, and they had these fighter planes, and they flew in threes. Because back in those days, you had too many, you'd shoot each other. So they'd have three planes that would work together, and with one, one, one was on someone's tail, they'd go back. My friends, the Bible says two or three are gathered in my name. I'm in the midst of them. You and I, all everyone needs two or three people that they can constantly be with and talk to and hold each other accountable because we're at war. And I want to encourage you in 23. And what's going to be happening in 23. So a godly me in 23. How many of you want that? I do. I do. Come on. Well, uh, one of my favorite pastors is Dr. Tony Evans. I love him. And uh, he uh, shared about what he thought about America, which I thought was interesting. He called America at the Humpty Dumpty. And uh, I know it sounds, uh, we're doing really well. Dr. Seuss, and now we're going to Humpty Dumpty. Uh, yeah, we, we, we have a high level of intellectualism here at Cornerstone Church. Uh, I think most of us know it. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Not the southern wall, but Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a what? And all the king's horses and all the king's men. Come on, where's your, where's your theology, everybody? <laughs> Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men. That means the White House, the State Department, the Congress, the Senate, the bills passed. Nothing could get Humpty Dumpty back together again all the king's horses and all the king's men my friends our country is like a humpty dumpty i know that's a little bit negative but look at what's happening our country has fallen off the wall and all the king's horses and all the king's men it doesn't make a difference if you're republican independent uh democrat there's not enough you can do to put it back together again there's only one that can put it back together again and that's god almighty we need a move of god in my life and your life so you look what's going on. I mean, look, look what's going on in our culture today, everybody. Listen, this is not about me up here better than everyone else. I tell you right now that without God, I have no business to stand here at all. I am not better than anyone else. Either is this church. We are full of broken people here. If you have your act together and you have no problems, please leave because you're going to ruin it for the rest of us because none of us are there. All of us are broken people. We need a Savior, okay? And this is what's going on. Our culture is broken. It is. Can you see what's going on? Uh, it's very sad. I see decay in our culture. You, you, you ever hear the statement, uh, the tide rises, all the boats rise with the tide. The tide goes down, all the boats go down the tide. Well, in many ways, uh, the American culture in particular, since we're in America, the culture, the church usually was a little above where the American culture was. So what's been happening is our culture goes down, so is the church. And just because we're a little above it, we think we're better. But my friends, I don't know if you realize it, but the way the church is today would be scandalous for our culture just 30 years ago. And what I see happening to our culture is not just me. It really hurts me. I'm like, my God, and not just me. How many of you realize what's going on here? It's pretty bad. Why are you, why are you clapping for that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Things are going bad. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Go ahead and clap. You shouldn't be clapping. But things are different. You know, I've noticed that. A very sad and moral decay in our culture, we see. I mean, I, I've noticed even things that used to work at Cornerstone don't work. I don't see the same devotion to the Lord as I said when I first got here. i got to be honest with you, everybody. i got to be honest with you. Uh, I don't see the same devotion to people I have for the Lord. And, and, and even in my own life sometimes, I find myself getting cold. And it's very easy to get cold. And things are different, not just because of COVID, but the moral decay. There's moral decay in our culture today. Churches and teachings are things that are not even right. There are studies that there are 17 countries around the world right now where the church is declining or barely holding on. But, and America is one of those, by the way, 
But do you realize in 187 nations in the world that the church is growing faster than the population of those countries? So good things are happening at the same time. But we can see the examples of decay. Can you not see the examples? I mean, look what just happened this past week. Uh, some guy stabbed four college students. I'm like, yeah, whatever, right? Come, let's be honest. You, you hear about, yeah, someone guys, oh, someone just shut up a mall. Okay. Remember how scandalous that was in Columbine High School? What happened a number of years ago? We're kind of used to it now. I just read yesterday that a six-year-old went to school, had a handgun, and shot a, na- shot a student. This happened. Now, I don't think the student knew what the student was doing. I think he went there think it was a toy and shot someone. But you can see what's going on in our culture, the wickedness. This is not about guns, okay? This is about the violence we see in our culture. We can see that you don't even know. Uh, for example, you have, I, I don't take this the wrong way, okay? But I got to be honest with you. When you have drag queens reading to little kids, hello, right? Uh, when you see people that, you see young girls that, are, are a little confused about who they are, and, and, and they, have, they go to doctors to get some help, and the doctor says, well, what we need to do, because after all, it's not what's inside of you that matters. What matters is on the outside. I always thought when I was growing up, it doesn't matter what you are on the outside. It matters what you are on the inside. But now we're telling people it doesn't matter about the, the inside. More important, you get your outside. What the heck is going on here? So people are getting their, their flesh cut off, body parts, and taking hormones and ruining their lives. This is insane. This is insane what's going on. Uh, and there's such a, a desire to, to, to get rid of the, uh, the, the unborn. I mean, you see all this stuff happening. I'm not standing here uh, better than anybody else, but this is what we see happening. It's incredible. I, I don't even feel safe going to New York City anymore. I go to a, a Knicks game or something. I, I go out, and I smell, I smell pot everywhere. I'm driving the car the other day. I'm like, what on earth did I run over? Oh, no, it's not a skunk. There's a guy in front of me smoking pot. He's swerving around. Everywhere I go, I'm reading about people that are, I mean, it's just everywhere, drugs, gambling, I mean, all this stuff. And you're like, oh, Pastor, you're such a prude. No, it, it, what's happening is destroying life and families. And, and God, are we doing something wrong? What's going on? Why is our culture falling apart the way it is? Why is there so much violence? Why is there so much hatred, right? What's going on? God, what's taking place in our culture? And God, what are we doing wrong? And I, I don't look at the world. I say, God, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me, God? What am I doing here? I've been trying here. For, I'm here for 21 years here in February, and things have gotten worse instead of better. That kind of bugs me a little bit. Now, the church is growing, and that's great. But I'm talking about our culture and all that, right? So we know what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 10. He talks about these, these times. He says the following. And by the way, it's okay to bring your Bibles to church. Paper Bibles. I I, I can't see it anymore without age, so that's why I have it on here. Okay, that's, that's because I'm not perfect with my eyes, okay? But this is what Jesus says. At that time, many will turn away from faith. So in the end times, many will turn away from the faith. I hear about people deconstructing their faith. Yeah, get over it. It's just the way it's going to be. Jesus said many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive Many people. You know the problem about being deceived? You don't realize you're deceived. Someone said to me sometime, I'm not deceived. The definition of deceived is you don't know you're being deceived. <laughs> okay, just something you think about, okay? Um, deceived many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Well, I don't care about anymore what I hear. It bothers me that it doesn't bother me about the four college students. It bothers me that I don't care anymore. I've gotten so conditioned about murder. I've gotten so conditioned about brokenness. I've gotten so conditioned because we're in it all the time. I don't want to get callous to you. With the love of most grow cold, listen to this, everybody, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. The ones that give their life to Jesus Christ and, and go all the way to the end, those are the ones that are saved. Can you lose your salvation? Well, the Bible says those who endure to the end. So those who endure to the end are the real ones. The other ones are imposters. So see where you are, right? Those who endure to the end will be saved. And this gospel, Jesus says, will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, which is ethnos, people groups. Then the end will come. So is the end coming now? I don't know. I don't know. 
I honestly do not know. But can we not see that we are living in many, we're living in the end times. What I can tell you is this. We're closer to the second coming of Christ than we were yesterday. That I can tell you. Jesus, by the way, says this. No one knows the day or the hour. Only the Father does. Not even the Son. So the guy in Texas with the big charts around, behind him that talks about when he's going to come back, I think Jesus told God, the hey, hey, God, uh, that guy in Texas says you're coming back. Is that true? I mean, hello. No one knows the day or the hour, but we are to be ready. That's what the Bible says. Now, this is not new, by the way. Cultures flung apart are something not new. We talked about this several weeks ago. We mentioned the fact that most cultures, about 245 years or so, 240 years, they rise to, to the top and they start degrading after that. The United States is 247 years old. So we're on that path, everyone. We talked about that. So, but we see this pattern in the Bible. So what has happened has happened before. So God gives us an antidote on how to handle this as a church and as a culture. And rather than telling the world to get their act together, I'd much rather get my act together so the world goes, wait a minute, they have their act together. So in 2 Chronicles 15, a prophet speaking to King Asa at the time, and he gives the king of Judah some wisdom about how to run his kingdom and uh, a warning and a history lesson that is good for you and I. You're going to see some points in here. Here it is. Second Chronicles 15, 5 and 6 says the following. In those days, it was not safe to travel about. Have you noticed maybe it's not safe to travel about sometimes? Yeah. Okay. In those days, it was not safe to travel about for all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil so a lot of problems going in place one nation was being crushed by another do we see that happening today yeah and one city urban violence one city by another because why why does this happen for why is these bad things happening why were there why was this not safe to travel why was a great turmoil why was people not safe why it was the devil the devil's attacking the people nope look what it says here everybody it wasn't the devil what was it what does it say God was troubling them. Listen, if God is troubling you, look out. I would propose to you today, you may not like this, I believe God is troubling America. I believe God is troubling America. I believe we're on a free fall. And it's not just me. I'm not just not me by myself and I. I'm hearing other godly men and women saying the same thing. Now, hold on. I'm out here. This is not a damnation message. Okay, this is an opportunity because God has given us the Bible, right? God was troubling them with every kind of distress. Well, how does that work? Well, hang on here, everybody. That's the Old Testament. Well, hang on here. God was troubling them. If God is your problem, it doesn't matter who you elect. It doesn't matter if you have a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent. It doesn't make a difference what you do. If God is against you, look out. God was troubling them. You know what it says? Well, that's the Old Testament. Okay, let's look to the New Testament. Romans 1.18 says the following. The wrath of God is being revealed. Guys, is it hot in here? I'm, I thought I was the only one sweating. All right, if someone could be so kind and tell someone to turn the air conditioner, now that'd be great. Okay, because I'm like dying up here. You don't, want me, you don't want me preaching in a tank top. <laughs> Not after all those holiday cookies. <laughs> the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the, uh, all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. How does this happen? His judgment. Let's look on. Verse 24 to, to summarize here. Therefore... God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Oh, why do we always have to talk about sex? I don't have to talk about it. The Bible talks about it. Why does the Bible talk about it for? Because the enemy understands the power of intimacy. And this is what the Bible says. He who sins, every other sins outside the body, but he or she who sins sexually sins against himself. And so what does the enemy want to do? He wants to get us, to hurt us ourselves. Are we, listen, if you're in the middle of that, or you've been through that, we're not here to condemn anybody. We all need a savior, okay? But that's what the Bible says. Therefore, God gave them over to sinful desires of the heart, sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Okay? So what happened? God gave them over. Do you want God to give you over? That's the judgment. When God says, have it your way. Have it your way. It's not Burger King. Okay? Have it your way. You wanted to go ahead and do that? Go ahead. 
go ahead, knock yourself out. When God says that, look out. In Romans 1.26, he says it again. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations to unnatural ones. What happened here? God gave them over. Verse 28, furthermore, they did as, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over. I'm going to do it my way. I don't care what you say. I'm doing it my way. That's antiquated. That's Puritan. We are free. We're progressive. We don't want to limit our freedom and what we're doing. We're killing ourselves because this is what happens, everybody. If I'm in a rowboat and I said, I want to do it my way, and I take a shotgun, and I shoot at the bottom of the, of the boat, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to sink. Why? Is, it the, is the boat angry with me? No. I broke the design of the boat. And the design is now breaking me. When we don't do God's way, it's not like God's throwing lightning bolts at us. When we go against God's design, the design will break us. This is what begins to happen. So our culture is like, I don't care what you say. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to poke a hole in the bottom of my boat because we have a big ship and we can handle it. See, we're still floating. You keep putting holes in the bottom of your ship, eventually you're going to sink. And this is what's happening. You violate God's design. God's design violates you. So it's not like God's upset. God wants you to do well. He wants me to do well. So, so then in verse 28, furthermore, they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so they do ought what not be done. Three times it says God gave them over. That's the judgment of God. When God says, I'm giving you, go ahead, do your own thing, go your own way, look out. And hopefully, it's almost like having someone in your home that's a drug addict, and you keep paying for them and keep helping them and you keep bailing them out. Sometimes you can let him or her fall flat on their face and hit the bottom before they look up. And God might be saying, okay, have it your own way. You're, you're telling me that, so go ahead. And what begins to happen, we begin to destroy ourselves. So three times, that's God's judgment. I think, unfortunately, I think God's letting us have our way. He's letting us have our way. He is. And this is what we call divine abandonment. That's a judgment of God. That's a judgment of God. And let me tell you one thing right now. I cannot lead this church, or I cannot lead this church without God. I tell you one thing. Church without Jesus stinks. I'm telling you, Christianity without Christ is horrible. And if, if there's no Jesus, I might as well go ahead and sell cars. It would be kind of fun, actually. Okay. I'm serious. I need God, and so do you. And so here's what we know about God. With God, we have peace. No matter what happens to us, we have a covering. You feel the covering of God in you. Without God, you have chaos, exposure. God is silent. Don't hear from him anymore. And that's, I don't want that. So how do we respond to all this? If God is our problem, if God is not the devil, if God is our problem, what do we do? And I do believe God is our problem. I do believe God is letting us have our own way. What do we do? I think one thing we do not do is point our finger at the culture and say it's their fault. I look at me. I look at me. We need to look at ourselves first. And so I want to look at three things here. You can see 2 Chronicles 15, 3. You see uh, the problem and you see the antidote. In 2 Chronicles 15, 3, it says this. For a long time Israel was without the true God. You can see this throughout the history. The prophet is sharing what has happened in Israel's history in the past and telling the king Asa, hey, King Asa, this is what happened in the past. This will happen again if you don't listen to this. And this is what he says. And this is what happens to us as well. For a long time, Israel was without a true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. Those are the three things, okay? Three things. We're going to look at each of them and then the antidote, okay? Number one, God was replaced. God was replaced without a true God. And it's okay to, to like things. It's okay to like sports. It's okay to like your job. It's okay to like going to church. You know church can become a God. You go to church all the time and yet not meeting with God. There's nothing wrong with sports. There's nothing wrong with golf. There's nothing wrong with enjoying good music. But if it takes the place of God, it becomes a God. Whatever supersedes God, whatever is above God becomes a God. That's the truth. God has to be first. The only way you and I can truly live our life appropriately and rightly based upon our design is to have God first. The moment God's not first, you're going to have a thirst and you're never going to be able to satisfy it. I'm telling you right now, that's the truth. 
So um, there's a bunch of fake gods going around. And so this is important. I, I'm not picking any group, but I, I've noticed that the desire to serve God is, is kind of going away a little bit. I mean, people say, ah, should I go to church? Ah, you know what? This is kind of nice. Let's just, let's, we'll watch it on Tuesday night. And Tuesday night never happens, right? Ah, you know, it's raining today. I don't want to go. Ah, it's sunny today. I don't want to go. I, and, we, and we get in the habit. Listen, I understand. I'm not saying this is the end all get all, but I'm saying this. This is a place where we encourage each other. The whole world is telling you something different. It's nice to be with other people that are going after the same thing and then having two or three people that you know that, that, that are with you, that can help you, that can help fight for you, that you're not by yourself, that you get picked off. So we have that. Okay, second thing is this. First thing is God was replaced. Number two, preachers were silent. There were plenty of priests back in those days, plenty of religious people, but they weren't speaking the truth. They believe in the Bible and teach the Bible. For, let me say, people, I heard, I heard a, a church said this a little while ago in advertising. The Bible is like your GPS. It usually tells you where to go, but sometimes it gets it wrong. That's what the church said about the Bible. No. The Bible is God's word. It is more than true. It is more than true. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. And we, I can show you, and I can show the authenticity of the Bible. The Bible is a supernatural book. I've had the privilege and honor of reading it over 20 times in the last 20 years. And let me tell you, the more I read it, the better it is. And I have never grown more than I have grown with my time with the Lord every day, going through it, reading it, and letting the Bible read me. And God speaks to me and powerfully, and God wants to speak to you as well. And so listen, I understand it might be hard to read the Bible through in the whole year. I understand that. But how about starting a new testament? Go to youversion.com or something like that. Pick a version and take time every day. I, I have to tell you that if, if there's been times where I experience the praise, praise of God, I experience the presence of God, but you know what? That does not sustain me. What sustains me is to daily walk with God. Sometimes you read the Bible and it's amazing. Sometimes you read the Bible and you fall asleep. Sometimes you read the Bible and you get nothing out of it. But progressive, you stay with it. You will grow. And we want to help you with these things. So the people today says, well, <clears throat> The, 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 the preachers are silent, and they, they, they refuse to preach, and they say, well, we believe the Bible. How many of you ever heard of Queen Elizabeth? Can you show that picture of her, please? It's a little, a little spooky. She's looking at me. <laughs> if her eyes move, let me know, okay? Oh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, but Queen Elizabeth, you know about, a little bit about England. Uh, the monarchy is the oldest form of government in the United Kingdom. But right now... The British monarchy is known as a constitutional monarchy. So but, but let me explain what it means. You have the House of Commons. You have a constitutional law there, okay? And they pass the rule law, rule law. The monarchy is only symbolic, right? It's symbolic. But people love the monarchy, right? They love Queen Elizabeth. They talk about her. Oh, I love the Queen of England. You saw what happened when she died. The whole world was excited about it. Not, I mean, I'm not excited about her dying, but they were excited about her and her legacy, how beautiful. They love the monarchy. They love all the gossip around it. We love the monarchy, especially in England. But the truth of the matter is they have no power. It's only ceremonial power. He says, here's the point. I believe we as a church have turned the Bible into a ceremonial thing that we like. We talk about it, but it has no power in our lives because I choose to do what I want to do and what I do not want to do. That's not, a, that's not a monarchy. We treat the Bible like the royal family in England. We enjoy it. We talk about it. We're proud of it. Oh, yeah, I love the queen. But do you do what God says? Many will come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Jesus, I don't know who you are. And so this is the truth, everybody. There's plenty of priests, but they were not doing it. They were picking and choosing what they wanted. There's stuff in the book. Society says, ah, that's kind of antiquated. Uh, but no, the Bible is God's word. I'm not changing. I, am, I do not change. I'm the Bible. That's what God says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. So listen, everybody. Whatever the Bible says, I'm going to live by. And if the society changes, let the society change. I will stand on the Bible. I don't care what they say. I, will not, I don't care what they do. At, as long as I'm alive with the Lord's help, I will do what the Bible says. That's it. I'm not changing. I'm not moving. Okay? And that's what we need to do. We need to stand. What, what does the Bible say about marriage? What does the Bible say about forgiveness? What does the Bible say about purity? What does the Bible say about all these wonderful things we are to do? What does the Bible say about taking care of the poor? 
All these things matter to God. So here the first one, God was replaced without the true God. Number two, preachers were silent. And here's the third, absolute truth was abandoned. This is my truth. You ever hear that? This is my truth. That, that, that makes no sense. This is my truth. If truth is not truth for everybody, it's not truth. This is what I like would be accurate. So we are telling people today there is no truth. There is no right and there is no wrong. There's no man. There's no woman. Men can have babies. Who ever thought that we'd had these conversations about men having babies? Hello. It's insane. It's very scary, everybody. People are confused about the very essence of what life is. God's not confused. And here, listen, everybody. Let me say this. I got my own issues. Ask my wife. I do. I got my own issues. I'm not standing up here saying I'm better than anyone else in this society. I am not. If not by the grace of God, I cannot stand. Okay? I understand that. But we must listen to our designer and the creator of our life, the God who loves us. So, God is, God isn't, God's a standard. I'm not the standard. Neither are you. Neither is Gallup Poll. I don't care what the survey says. I don't care about Steve Harvey, okay, what the survey says. I'm going to do what God says. God is troubling for three reasons. God was replaced, preachers were silent, and absolute truth was abandoned. But we come to verse 4. I'm so glad they come to verse 4. You know what verse 4 says? Here we go. Ready? But in their distress, they turned to the Lord and sought him, and he was found by them. Those are three things. So we'll look at the three things. They turned to the Lord, they sought him, and they found him. Here I'm asking, okay, if I'm a quarterback on the field, I'm going to call out a call for all of us to do in this next year. You hear, know what it is? To turn, to seek, and to find. To turn, to seek, and to find. Now, what does turning mean? Turning means repentance. Repentance means turning from one way to the other. Repentance also means changing your mind. God wants us to turn from what is wrong to turn what's right, to change our mind. I don't care if everyone is doing it. Right? What is turning? Repentance. We need to go back to the lordship of God. There is not a revival in the history of society, of the world, without repentance. Turning from what is evil. You know, Martin Luther, uh, from the church reformer, nailed 95 theses on the, uh, on the door, and this is what he said. One of the things he said was this. Not in those things. Just this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance, turning away from what is wrong. Listen, guys, God doesn't want you to hurt yourself and hurt each other. We have to turn away from what we know is wrong. In Hebrews 12, 25, it says this, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we? This is when God spoke to the Israelites to change their ways, okay? Let's continue to read. If we turn away from him who warns us from heaven, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken will remain so when god shakes us the things that fall off what remains i shared with you earlier about how we have people like tim keller who's stage four cancer everything's being shaken and what remains is what really matters when you die one day what really matters is you and god that's all that really matters ultimately right verse 28 therefore since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It doesn't make a difference what happens. The kingdom of God cannot be shaken. What do you want to stand on? Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. 
I thought God was Barney, the, the, the dinosaur. No, he's a consuming fire. If you have someone working on high-powered lines and they provide for their family and they're making good money working on power lines, that worker, he or she is up there. They have a godly consuming fire of that, of that uh, power line because if they don't handle it correctly, they're going to be fried chicken, Right? Think about that. They have a godly reverence, and God wants us to have a godly reverence because he is a consuming fire. So, I want to train myself in a life that attracts God. You and I will make mistakes. We can't help it. What I mean by that, we can't help it, but listen to what I'm trying to say. You and I are imperfect beings, okay? I'm not suggesting we're perfect. But what I'm suggesting is we go after God who is perfect and that we help each other. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, this is what it says. And it's important. If my people, not if those people, is it if my people who are called by my name, right, will humble themselves, that I don't have it all together, right, and pray. We need to pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. I don't have any wicked ways. Yeah, you do. I got wicked ways. I guarantee you got some wicked ways in your life. Really? Yeah, you want to test those wicked ways? How was your holidays? How was the holiday table? Oh, I couldn't wait to get out of there. Well, I wonder what's going on. Do you have any unforgiveness in your life? We all have wicked ways. We all have wicked ways. And the person that has the most wicked ways is the one who thinks that they don't have wicked ways. Turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That's the answer for our country. But we have to be the antidote. But if we have no antidote power, how are we supposed to make a difference in our culture if we're as bad as our culture? We have to rise above our culture. Not because we're better, because we want to be healthy, so we can make a difference. God doesn't have us here just to occupy space and time. He has us here to be the antidote through Jesus Christ. He's releasing us to make a change. Well, you guys are awfully silent today. The first service was amen in me. You guys are like, uh-oh. <laughs> Look at David, King David. King David. We're studying him. Uh, men, we're having a great time on Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. I encourage you to come. We're going through the life of David. And David was a man after God's own heart. But he was a pretty bad screw-up. You know what he did? He, was, he saw a pretty woman. Why, I must have her. He slept with her, got her pregnant. And then he's like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. He tried to get her husband to sleep with his wife. He wouldn't do it because he was at war. And so he said, what am I supposed to do? He killed the man, okay, lied about it, and then took the guy's wife or his own wife. Now, is that pretty bad? Okay, you sleep with someone that's not your spouse. You kill their spouse, and then you marry them, and you lie. But do you realize with all that screw-up, the line of Jesus comes through David. And there are people a lot worse. There are people a lot better in the Bible than David, yet the Davidic monarchy does not come through them. He does this Messiah line. Why is that? Because David owned his sin and gave his sin up. David humbled himself. So I, maybe you've killed somebody. I don't know. But I think a lot of us in this room are not as bad as David was. There's hope for you and I. Here it is. And what did David do? In Psalm 51, he, he shows us what he did. And we have a look in how his heart was right with God. See, God's, he's looking for a wholehearted men and women. And this is what he said. Psalm 51, 1. <clears throat> have mercy on me, O God. Right? How many of you need mercy? According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. He doesn't blame somebody else. Well, God, you know, uh, I wasn't getting enough of my wife, so I couldn't. No. I, she says, my transgressions, not someone else's. Wash away my iniquity. You have to own it before you can give it away. How are you supposed to give something away if you don't own it? You've got to own it first. Then you can give it away. Blot out my transgressions. Wash all my iniquity and cleanse me from my indiscretion. No. Sin, call it what it is. For I know my transgressions and my sin are always before me. You have this monkey on your back. Always, if she ever found out, if he ever found out that I stole the money, if my boss ever knew I did this, if anyone knew about this situation, if anyone knew what I was really like, uh, 
How about we kill the monkey in our back by getting it off our back, by confessing before the Lord? Now check this out. Verse 4. Against who? You, God. Against you, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Now check this out. Surely I was what? Sinful at my birth. My friends, you and I are born in sin. You're not perfect. You need God. So there is David. Now check out as we go on to verse 17 of Psalm 51. You know what the sacrifice is, everybody? How to get free? Listen to this. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit. The only way you can ride a horse is if that horse is broken. The only way you and I have any validity or can make a big difference for God is that you and I have to be broken. Being broken is a good thing. Broken means you've given up control of yourself to the master who rides you. That's what you and I need. That's what I need. My sacrifice, oh, oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Listen to this. You will not deny. God will not deny you if you admit your sins and your brokenness. And that's not just the Old Testament. Look at the New Testament. 1 Peter 5, 5 to 6. God opposes the proud. Do you want God opposing you? I don't. He hates the proud. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll lift you up. My friends, that's what we're calling to do. So, God, I need your mercy, and I need your grace. So what do they do? They did three things. They turned to the Lord, number one. Number two, they sought him in prayer. A.T. Pearson said this, There's never been a spiritual awakening in any country or locality that didn't begin united in prayer. My friends, you and I need to be praying. We need to stir up our hearts and get right with God. God is giving us up to ourselves. The evidence is undeniable, everybody. But we as the church have to do our part. We have to humble ourselves, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. You know what Hosea says, the prophet, it says this, 10, 12. Sow righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love. Break up your unplowed heart. It's time to seek the Lord. In other words, get rid of your hard hearts. God, break my heart, God. Break my heart, O oh God, for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers you with righteousness. I don't want God's abandonment, do you? I want God's showering. I want to break my heart. I want God to break my heart for what breaks his. You know what Habakkuk says? I love what the prophet Habakkuk says. It's an invitation to all of us today, and I pray the same for us today. Listen to this. Lord, I've heard your fame. Habakkuk 3.2. I stand in all of your deeds. Lord, Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. So what are the three things they did? They turned to the Lord. That's the first thing. They sought after him. If you will search of me all your heart, you will find me. And number three, they found him in revival. He was found by them. And historically, we can see throughout, uh, we had two great awakenings in America, and we can see what happened. And I, I just want to let you know that God can do it again. But it always happened through a praying church first, that we set the ground for it, that God has called us to pray, to humble ourselves, to stop living in sin. You and I are living in sin. We are. And we're hurting ourselves and hurting our next generation. So what do we do? I just, there's more I can share, but we need to get to the end of this today. What are we to do? We're to seek God. We're to humble ourselves. And so why, what are we doing right now? We're, we're inviting you to participate in our 21 days of fasting and prayer, that we'd humble ourselves. Maybe you can take the next 21 days. We start today, and every day we're changing it up a little bit this year. We're going to meet at 12 o'clock uh, noon. I call it a power, no lunch. <laughs> Maybe take every day from 12 to 1 and, and take time to join us and, and, and hear an inspiring word as we talk about how we can draw closer to Christ and spend time in prayer and maybe fast something. And maybe, uh, maybe how about this one? This would be a really amazing one. The worship team did this. Fast these things. When I was away, 
uh, fasting and praying a little bit, you know what I realized? I'll be honest with you. I'm addicted to this thing. I am. Uh, all you have to do is look at your history. Apple has this thing with toast shows you how much you spend your time on your phone. I'm like, oh my God. Look how much time I'm, oh my God, I'm talking to God. <laughs> look how much time I'm spending. I'm spending way too much time on this thing. It's not the phone's fault. I've given into the, the, the algorithms. I've given into myself. And it's all good stuff about preachers, about news. But what happens is I, I'm sitting there, my family's talking. I'm looking at my stupid phone. How about we do this? I double dog dare you. Turn off the social media for 21 days. Instagram, gone. Snapchat, gone. Instagram, whatever it is. I don't even know what it is. TikTok, whatever. Give it a break. I can't do that. Really? If you can't do it, there's a problem. I need to fix. Seriously, I, I dare you to fast social media for 21 days. I dare you. I dare you to do it. Will you join me in doing it? I'm going to do it. How about this? I dare you to fast. I'm going to fast. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to fast, but there's different ways of fasting. Maybe you can fast sweets and meats. Maybe you can fast things that chew. I don't know. It's not a godly diet. I'm, I'm, Jesus says when you fast. He doesn't say if you fast. He says when you fast. Fasting is something we've lost in our culture today. We need to fast and we pray. Why? Am I on a hunger strike to make God move? No, I'm not a prisoner burning my mattresses to have the warden let me out of prison. That's not what we're talking about. Fasting is to get you in a place to hear from God. There's something powerful when you fast and pray. Uh, why am I so passionate? Because I spent three, di three days with the Lord, and the Lord has told me a number of things. And it's time for us to get right with God. We're under judgment, everybody. Do you want to play church? Really? We're in a nosedive. But God has you and I as an army to save this world. So what are we on? All right, fast and pray, everybody. So I encourage you to do that. Fast, pray. Get yourself to hear from God. I want to cry when I hear about people being shocked. I want to care when I hear about the poor. I want to care when I know people are being aborted. I want to care when the elderly are mistreated. I want to care when the immigrants are mistreated. I want to care when people are mistreated. I want to care when politicians speak trash about each other. I want to care. Listen, we need to turn off Fox News, MSNBS News, and we need to get on our face before God. I dare you. Turn off the TV, turn off the social media, and give it 21 days. John, what happened in those 21 days? Oh, you can't even talk. All right, we'll talk about tomorrow. Those guys did it for 21 days. It made a big difference in their life. I dare you. All right. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I, I stand up here no better than anyone else, but God, we don't want to be fooled. Father, you have us here for a reason. You have us here to love you and enjoy you forever, but you have us here in history to make a difference. You placed us right here, right now in this culture, but Father, we're of the world. We don't want to be of the world. We know, Lord God, that friendship with the world makes ourselves an enemy with you. So, Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you break our hearts, God. Father, I pray that we would do that, Lord, that we would get serious with you, God. If we have a problem with social media, that we would let go of it, Father. We'd fast and we'd pray. And, Father, that you would do a work in our heart and our mind, that you would revive this church, God, that you would truly grow us, God, not just numerically, but internally, oh God, that we become a mighty move, that we'd see our families transform, our communities transform, our towns transform. And, Father, what can happen when 120 people are sold out to you? We saw what happened on the day of Pentecost. Father, we need you. Lord, break our heart. Holy Spirit, break our heart. Lord, break our heart. Lord, we're calloused. We don't even care about sin anymore. We don't care about it. God, please, Lord God, do not give us to ourselves. Please, oh God, have mercy on us, oh God. Have mercy on us. Do not give us to ourselves. Lord, break our hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen.